All right, it's time we had a chat about intellectual property games. Welcome to Tabletop Shop. Welcome back to yet another episode of the Tabletop Shop Podcast. Another I one? one of your co- ho- an- another one, man. Another one. Yeah, We've man. done more than one. And this I'm sorry, is I interrupted your, than your cool spiel. I know, man. I was right in the middle of a pre-rehearsed speech about me being a co-host of the Tabletop Shop Podcast. Wait, and that so my can, name is. Nick what's Hart. the difference between between a pre-rehearsed speech and a rehearsed speech? Oh, actually, that's true. Is pre-rehearsed a word? I don't think so. I think you're making up stuff, man. That's probably true. All right. You interrupted my rehearsed speech. Ah. Uh, you know what? And that's Cody Pennington. All the way across the world still, but just a little bit closer than the last episode. Yeah. You moved actually. You moved one time zone closer. I am one time zone closer. Yes. I am now in uh, the great mother country of England. Uh, the land of the American forefathers. Well, yes. some actually, of them. What's funny is I'm actually in Plymouth. England, yeah. which would be exactly where our forefathers left England. So that's kind of interesting. little fun fact for you. Huh. Are you feeling rebellious? Mm, actually, I've only felt rebellious twice since I've been here. Okay. Do you want to tell yes. us about that? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, How did the Brits yeah, feel about Plymouth? Do, do they like stand there and look over the ocean sometimes? They're like, this is the place where they left us. You know what? I feel like they try and kind of erase all memory of the past because, yeah, we, we did them <laughs> dirty for a while. So, yeah, well, that's cool. Anyway, what's this podcast really about? Uh, well, you know what? For starters, it's got to be about the mundaneness, mundanity of the mm. games that we drudge through during our daily lives, Cody. Um, I have well, some some repeats to mention this week, but I have some new ones to mention too. Okay. I have some new um, ones as well. Awesome. I, I am excited to hear your new ones. Your new ones are probably more interesting than mine. I'm not going to lie. I, I hope so. But <laughs> <laughs> actually, you know what? I guess I only have one new one, but the other one has I haven't played in a long time. But okay. Okay. despite those great leads into my games i'm gonna let you go first all right that's fine that's fine um so seven wonders duel again great two-player game i managed so in seven wonders duel there's three ways to win it's basically just a pretty straightforward i don't know if i'd say it's straightforward but it's it's a simple yet very strategic card drafting game um loosely based on seven wonders and i there are three ways to win the game one is just by tallying points, um, but there's two other ways, one of which is a military victory, and I received yet another one of those. I think I really? mentioned last episode or two episodes ago that I won with the military, and I've done it again now. Actually, I think I technically did it twice in a row. So, yeah, that was pretty awesome. You'd think Anna would have learned her lesson at this point. You would think so, man. You would think so. <laughs> I almost did it again today, actually, but yeah, not quite. And okay, then she, she ended up beating you. me on points. So that's ah. the thing is if you if you really pursue the victory route and you don't yeah. get there, yeah, it's you're it sacrificing you. a lot of points otherwise. Yeah. It's a yeah, it's a yeah. great, brilliant balance. I love it. It is, for sure. Um and actually everything else I have to mention is technically new. One of them is Dominion, because I I have not mentioned Dominion yet, I think, on the podcast, no. although I've played it many a time. Okay. Um but you actually mentioned the digital version to me, maybe even on the, the podcast last episode. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, man. Um, but yeah, there's a great new app for Dominion out. Uh, and so I've been playing that a ton. Actually, I think I've played it almost 30, almost 30 games already. Oh, dang, um, man. Which is I because, got burned out after like five. <laughs> well, here's the thing is it randomly gives you new expansions to play for a short period of time. So... When I first started playing, it was just the base set, but also uh, the Menagerie uh, expansion was unlocked. I was like, that's weird. But all the cards were available for playing like against bots online and against matchmaking. I could play with On also. So I was like, that's cool. Um, and then after a couple of days, it was gone. 
but it had unlocked a different one, a different expansion, the Seaside huh. expansion. And so I was like, oh, okay, cool. Now I can play with all these cards and the base still. Yeah. And then a few days ago, it switched to Empires. And now Seaside is locked up again, but now the Empires expansion is unlocked. So anyways, that is part of the reason. If it was just the base game, I would have been not playing as much. But because it's cycled through a few expansions, two of which I have not played before, I've I've gotten a lot of games out of it. And it plays so much faster too. So Okay. So I did see that when you told me about the how it includes a free expansion, I looked and I also had Seaside, which was unfamiliar to me. So maybe I did also start with the same, like the game must put out the same free expansion and then yeah. it switches it out for everybody whenever Yeah, it, it seems like every week or something like that, every certain amount of time it switches to a different expansion, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. I've been playing a lot of that. Okay. I have also played... Uh, well, technically Rummy Cube a couple times, but that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, <laughs> uh, not a fan. Um, I played a game called Lou Garou, which I'm probably saying that totally wrong. It's a Lou French game. Garou? Actually, it's not a French game, really. It's just Werewolf. It's just Werewolf, but in French. Um, so I've played oh, that quite a okay. few times because there's a few other people living here in this house. Actually, 11 other people, to be exact. Um, Wait, did, but we've did actually Anna had play? some... Did yes, Anna play too? So that means a German girl played a French game in England. But it's not really a French game. It's just like the French printing, you know? So no, well, hey, come on, man. But actually, give me, give me something. I've never actually played Werewolf before, technically. I've played Mafia, which is kind of like you just use a deck of cards and you give them some abilities. Uh, but I've never yeah. actually played Werewolf before. And it's a, it's amazing because there's so many different um, different roles you can play. as. I don't know if you're really familiar with Werewolf at all. Are you? I I think I've played it maybe once. My more of my familiarity is with Secret Hitler, which I think is the same concept, but just well, a the, different game. A brief overview of Werewolf is basically everyone gets a hit and roll, like a secret roll face down. Yeah. Um, and a couple of people are werewolves, and then there's all in this version, which is kind of like the deluxe version. There's a ton of different roles that do different things, but basically everyone goes to sleep at night, and there's a narrator, like a person that's running the game. And they tell the werewolves to wake up and they ask who they want to kill and they kill someone. And then they go back to sleep. But then there's everyone else has a different role. And so you basically everyone's trying to kill the werewolves or the werewolves are trying to kill everyone. Yeah. And But there's all these different roles that make the game so like convoluted, but in a good way. Like there's the Cupid one where Cupid wakes up and it can uh, they can pick two other people that are kind of quote unquote in love. And then the narrator... <laughs> The narrator taps those two people and they look up and see each other and then they know that they're in love and they get to see each other's identities and they go back to sleep and now they those two have to win together regardless of what their identities are they have to win together die together basically and so there's all these different roles that mess around with how people are influenced because uh during the day phase after everyone wakes up the everybody in the town gets to vote one person out and kill them basically and okay. so everyone has all these different biases kind of depending on their identity that can make them more or less suspicious and people thinking they're a werewolf, but they're totally not. They're maybe just trying to save someone's back because they're the lovers or whatever, you know? Hmm. So it's, it's amazing. It's a great yeah social deduction game. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I downloaded a couple digital games. Actually, I was looking through to try to find some more digital board games and I decided to give evolution a try. Um, huh. which I kind of just, I don't know. I was never really interested in trying it. It didn't seem that interesting and it's not that great, but I feel like maybe <laughs> I, I, I don't, basically what you do is you have like, you're dealt some cards. There's like four or five rounds or something. You're dealt cards and, um, the cards have different abilities basically and a number assigned to them. And you can play a card down just to create a species. Um, it doesn't have any abilities. You just create a species with that card. And mm -hmm. then with your other cards, you can give that species traits. Um, and basically what you're trying to do is trying to feed your species and add more traits to it to make it more powerful. Um, so at the beginning of the round, everybody throws a card blindly in the middle and all those cards are flipped over and whatever their numbers are, they add up. That's how many food there is available for that round. And then everyone's then takes turns like playing cards and then you take turns feeding your uh, creatures that you've created, trying to get them all fed. Hmm. Um, the reason it's kind of interesting is that you can create carnivores, uh, and then carnivores feed off of other 
players creatures um but they have to be more powerful um so you have like you have like you can add to your body size and you can add to the number of like creatures within each species and but i don't know the whole thing felt a little too simple a little too straightforward um yeah, okay it didn't grip me that much i played it a few times i thought it was okay but it didn't really feel special i know there is an expansion for it but i'm probably not going to bother downloading it i don't think or buying it hmm. so okay yeah all right i'll take that and then i i also tried the digital version of oniram which is a game that has been uh touted by Z Garcia uh, quite a bit. Um, it showed up on his list on the Dice Tower quite often. Mm. And I saw that it was f- like free to download and I was like, well, you know, might as well try it, right? Like yeah. there's no reason not to. Um, and again, it was kind of like, you're basically just like flipping over cards and there's four different colors um, and they have a, there's a couple different symbols. Uh, and you have like a hand of like five cards and you want to play three cards in a row of the same color to unlock a door. And you're trying to unlock two doors of every color, basically. Um, but you can only, you can't play the same symbol twice in a row. So you have to play three cards, alternating symbols of the same color. And there's not much more to the game than that, honestly. Like there's a few other things that make it a little interesting. Basically, you're, you're trying to unlock all the doors before you run out of cards, before the deck runs out. Okay. And there's a few like attack cards in the deck that, make it harder um and there's like a couple other special ways to get to unlock doors but i don't know i played it a few times and i was kind of like this like this is not this is just just, it didn't feel like there was really any content there it was like i would rather play solitaire honestly like the you know your typical like solitaire with a deck of cards i think would be more interesting than this game so Mm -hmm. yes that is my journey through a few different new games this week you got it you got an old classic case of ldbzg let down by Z Garcia. <laughs> Led. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Anyway. Thought we were going down a different route there for a second, but nah, nah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I've been playing, man. I got some digital scythe plays in there once more. Uh, I've not played Wingspan for a while because, like I say, I got it like another hundred plays in there. Got a little burnt out, and so <laughs> it's crazy. Just switching back to scythe. It's crazy. Um. Yeah. Not much to say about that other than it's my number one game and it's incredible. Seven Wonders Duel as well. I don't remember. Eh, maybe Kirsten beat me. I think she did. Ah, dang it. That's right. I'll get her back eventually. That's right. I lost on it today also, so it is what it is. No. Okay. We can just have our, our bro loser club. Pity party. Yeah. yeah. Join me. Champions of Midgard. I just got that oh, purchased yeah, recently yeah. with both expansions. For awesome. a grand total of like eighty dollars, I think for all three uh-huh. of them, which is fantastic. Because I've yeah. been looking for that for a while. I'm trying to convince you to give me yours, but ha! Now I can just have my own <laughs> free version. Although well, I, I will, know, still, well, not free version. You know what I mean? I know. Um, both the expansions were out of print for a long time, and yeah, the the game was also recently out of print for a while. Because I have another friend who was trying to buy it, and he had it ordered it like. Jeez, almost a year ago, I think. And he still was like, yep, it's not back in stock yet. So I haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> so, but yeah, he, he also told me oh. he just like got his copy a couple months ago or something. So, okay, sweet. Well, it's, it's a bit of a slightly different experience for me because your, your game, you had taken out the like blue, red, yellow, green meeples and replaced mm-hmm. them with like the camo colored, like brown, gray, and yes, uh, green, like camo green colors which fits the game aesthetic a lot better yes it does um, and i and i just been used to playing with those so i forgot that that's not what the game originally comes with and pulled out these meeples like what blue and red and what's going on here yellow this looks terrible i know but that's right i got used to it yeah just a phenomenal game um you know that i i have made this my my featured game from last year based on my super fancy calculations of how many like what what place in my top 100 it ended up at combined with how many spaces it moved over the course of the year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely definitely a fantastic game. Worker placement and dice it. worker placement at the same time. That's true. Well, uh, it's more like dice assignment. I wouldn't call it dice yeah. placement, Tom, which is a Tom really, Vassal, really weird distinction. But I know. T- Tom Vassell called it dice worker placement it made me think for a little bit like are they really workers though like i guess you are kind of saving them and then 
then you're able to reuse them if they don't die, you know. But I feel like I feel like what what is inherent in both dice placement and worker placement in X placement games. I feel like you have to place something and then get something at some point. It doesn't have to be immediately or whatever, but basically yeah. with with this game it's like okay, I have one or two combats I can issue I can do. And so I'll issue my dice out however I want. Mm. I'll split my dice up and just allot them to those, the combats, you know? It's not like you're taking a spot with them. You take a spot with the worker, and then you send dice to that spot, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. I guess they function more like a resource. Because in true worker placement games, you're you're competing over limited spaces. Yeah. And this is a worker placement game in that you use your workers for that, but then the dice you assign right. afterwards. So I guess it yeah. is more of a, an assignment. So take ha. that, Tom Basil. Ha! And, gotcha. and Cody, since you were on his side for a second. <laughs> well, yeah, it was, it was just a little bit. <laughs> um, got me some Splendor Duel action in there. Okay, nice. Good good little game. Still just kind of feels like Splendor and that there's that sort of a tense race going on, which isn't quite my favorite, but there are more ways to uh, win in the in the Seven Wonders Duel fashion. And so I appreciate that. Okay. But my, okay. my last game is going to be the most interesting. I got... You know, I just bought Gloomhaven because I had a price alert on it for if it ever Great. dropped below ninety dollars, and I got it for eighty three dollars. Yeah. Boy, at a somebody must have mini- been selling out to make room for Frosthaven stock or something. Well, I guess Miniature Market does this like voted by the fans discount day. Really? I don't know if it was a day or a week or something, and so there was a bunch of things that were on sale because I guess people had voted for it. One of those things was Gloomhaven, huh. so I was like, "Yeah, boy!" I grabbed <laughs> that. What? I was, I was, that's just a very interesting concept. Yeah. I mean, obviously your, your most popular things are going to get voted to be cheaper. So it's kind of an odd business concept, but I mean, but if, if it, it gets people to buy, if you're still profiting and it gets people to buy the games, then yeah, yeah exactly. But 83 and in the way of miniature market, you get free shipping on orders, $99 and above. And so I needed to find something that was at least $16. And so I found Hanamikoji that was exactly $16. So it got me right up there to the free shipping margin. Uh, have you heard of Hanamikoji? That, it sounds familiar, but I, I'm not sure. I hadn't heard of it before, but I the first thing I saw is that it had a Dice Tower Seal of Excellence on the front. That's I was good. like, okay, okay $16 game, uh, good seal. And I, I looked up a little review of it, and it seemed pretty interesting, so I bought it. So this game uses the game mechanic that I have heard of before, but just never played and didn't really understand what it was. It's called I Split, You Choose. Yeah, and right. the Yeah, the base function is one player is going to be dividing some sort of resource group, and then the other opposite player gets to choose one of those divisions. And then it's very interesting mind-bending logic gaming. <laughs> so the theme of Hanamakoji is there are It's a Japanese-themed game. There's seven geishas in the middle of the board. It's exclusively two-player, two-player only. And each each geisha has a certain number of cards assigned to them that are in this deck. Um, So there's a total of, I was going to say 21 cards, I think. But it's not exactly three cards per geisha. Whatever. There's So like there's uh, three geishas that are like level two. Um, And so they each have two items assigned to them in the deck. And then there's like two level threes and then a four, then a five. And so you're each player is playing a total of four actions, four unique actions that you have to play each of them at least once over the course of the round that let you somehow either assign a card secretly down um, towards one of those geishas or discard some cards. Or then there's two, I split you choose actions where basically you're just trying to get as many geishas to your side as possible. And to do that, you have to assign the related cards for a given geisha. And then at the end of the round, you have to have more assigned cards to a geisha in order to win their favor. Um, so like if the, the geisha that has three cards in the deck, if you get two cards down on your side, now it's impossible for the other person to get that geisha because there's only one card left. And it's just mm-hmm. kind of a little have these math logic like that and at the beginning of the round you always randomly throw out one card unseen so you also don't know what card is missing from the entire deck as you're all trying to vie for the favor of these geishas and then the first player to get four of the seven geishas favors like wins at the end of the round or 
obviously the geishas that are harder to get because they have more points or more cards assigned them, it's like five or four, you whoever gets 11 of those points total can win. So it's possible to win if you only have three geishas. So anyway, all that to say, it's a very fast playing game. Unique concept I never played with before, and I lost both times. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about that very direct kind of tug of war? Like two player game, there's some things in the middle that you're trying to win. And so you're kind of just playing cards down to have more yeah. influence on each one. How do you feel about that kind of mechanism? Yeah, here's the thing. If this was a long game, I don't think I'd like it very much. Okay, But yeah, since sure. a game is like 15, maybe 20 minutes at the most, I mean, you it probably only takes you about three rounds at the most to play a game. I actually lost the first round <laughs> for the first game because <laughs> Kirsten already got four. I thought I was doing well. I, got, <laughs> I thought I had enough cards out. I don't know what was going on, man. And she was tired too. So I don't know if she even 100% knew what she was doing. So maybe I was just playing like super terribly. But yeah, that's that's my cool story. That's hilarious. That's amazing. I feel I'm not I feel like I haven't played really a whole lot of games that function that way. Um I have played like Shot and Totten, which does function that mm. way. You basically are directly yeah. laying cards down and trying to get like runs or whatever and beat the other person's combo that they lay down. Um as a general concept, it really doesn't interest me that much. I think I, I like Shot and Totten okay, but in general, like that kind of like core to a game is kind of something that I it doesn't attract me necessarily. Hmm. It's but. nice to have for a, a very easy, quick game to pull out. Like it's probably the easiest game at this point for us to pull out and play. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. As to well, how often I, we'll be playing it, I'm not sure. I'm sure that whenever we see each other again at some point in the future, we could bang out a quick game of it and I will I can give my how do you say um valid opinion afterwards because right now I have an invalid opinion so (laughs) ah okay I see baseless opinion how about that yes yeah yeah Yeah. all right well that we've, we've spent like 20 minutes on this that's too much for sure that's way too long people don't care that much about the stuff we've played so we better mosey on over to the next segment of the podcast here and talk about a very, very popular game. Of the week. All right, Cody. Our game of the week, like I just finished saying a second ago, is one of the... It's actually technically two years old now and i feel like it's still kind of one of the hottest games out right now what do you think i'd say so yeah have you considered buying this game i have considered buying this game there there's a couple of games that have been higher on my list so i have not yet purchased it but this is another game that has performed very well for me over the year 2022 where when i first played it i was like ah, ah, okay but now it's like i miss this game I want it in my library. Mm. That's good to hear. Makes me happy to hear. And that game, of course, could be nothing other than Dune Imperium. Mm -hmm -hmm. This is like your your number two game, right? It may or may not be, yes. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I love this game. Um, My history with this game, actually with the whole Dune franchise in general, like it all started when I was sitting in a movie theater, all right? And I don't know what I was watching, probably something terrible. Um, And a trailer came on and I watched like the first five or 10 seconds of the trailer. And I was like, whatever this movie is, I need to see it. It looks amazing. (laughs) Cause like the first, like I distinctly remember how like, it's like uh, Duncan Idaho, like jumping out of uh, one of the thopters onto the sand. And then it's Paul like in a room with the, uh, one of the mothers and like, aesthetically it just looked amazing and the music and everything and i was like i don't know what this is yet but i need to see whatever this movie is <laughs> and uh yeah when i found out it was dune i was like okay i'm gonna go read all the books well not all the books but i read the first six sure and i was completely just like drawn into the world i the books are amazing i absolutely loved them mm-hmm. um it's very strange at times but still very good books and then when i saw that there was a game also 
I was like, I need this game. It looks amazing. It was a, it's a card draft or not card drafting, um, deck building and worker placement game, which I thought was cool. Hmm. And the, it just looked amazing too, I thought. And so I just bought the game also and fell in love with the game and the franchise and yeah, everything. Yeah. Cool story, bro. <laughs> that's my, <laughs> that's my ode to, to do to Dune franchise. What is your history with this franchise? If anything, so I'd seen a friend on Facebook share the trailer about Dune and I, I had no idea what it was. I'd never heard of Dune, but I could tell by the way he shared it uh, that this gentleman was extremely excited about it. And it's like the more people I talked to or encountered, they they seemed to be aware of like what this thing was going to be. I'm like, what? OK, what is this interesting sci fi thing I've never heard of that apparently is has some sort of cult following behind yeah. it? Um, and you know what? I think my first experience with it was the game because the game came out before the movie was actually out. Yeah. 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 So I, I guess it, it kind of left my radar for a while and then you got the game and then I played the game with you. And I remember you kind of explaining some of the, the thematics of like what the show, not the show, what the, the movie and the book is about based off of what you encounter in the game. And I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of interesting. Uh, but then like time went on and the hype continued to build for the movie. Um, so I went and saw the movie and I was like, okay, this is pretty dope. <laughs> this yeah. is a good movie. <laughs> this is an insane universe. Uh, so pretty soon after that, I, I read the book and I got the, I got, got the whole story. I think I read Dune Messiah after that too. I know I read a second book. I'm, I'm not really sure which one it was. <laughs> <laughs> Very impactful. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that made me appreciate the game more probably but then even just playing the game multiple times after that it made me enjoy the mechanics of the game more too so you've got sort of this double threat coming on of like the theme is compelling like it's paul atreides look there's duncan idaho you can do these cool things uh mixed with like just just the the way worker placement is used in that game where you only have two guys and eventually you can at a high price, get your third guy. But then there's the Mentat that you can also move around as an extra neutral worker. But then on top of that, you have a, a semblance of deck building that's not as strong as some other deck builder games are, but that's okay because it doesn't need to be that strong. But then on top of that, you've got this, uh, not really a war game, but just sort of a, you're vying for control for these battles every round. And you can, you can try to win the round and get points or you can try to purposely get second place without committing too much of your resources and you can still get a bonus yeah the main thing that turned me off of the game originally was the whole get 10 points and the game is over and usually the person that got 10 points wins and you know that i'm just not the biggest fan right of, for sure yeah. of win conditions like that uh but i i guess it's just kind of grown on me over time that's that's I my dune testimony that was that was amazing, Cody. Because not only did you give me your Dune your Dune testimonial, but you also explained the game. At the same uh, time. That's what I was thinking, man. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, here's my history with the Dune universe, and also let me explain how the game works. Yeah. Seamless, and it was it really was seamless too. That, that was amazing, Cody. Very smooth. Hey, thanks. So. Um, hey, what what if we just submitted this segment of the podcast to the guys that do the really terrible <laughs> announcement videos for the expansions? Okay, all right, we got to take a real <laughs> quick pause here. I have already mentioned this, I think maybe once on the podcast, but if you want a, a good couple laughs, go find the announcement video for either. I mean, preferably the Rise of Ix expansion, but also yeah. the Immortality expansion, either one. Go watch the announcement video for those and, and you will laugh. That's all I'm going to say. Look at um, their dead eyes. <laughs> okay, well, be nice. Be nice. Because one of those guys is the designer. <laughs> all right. And he did a very good job, actually. He did a very good job. Okay. Um, the other guy did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, so it is a worker placement game. It's a little strange as you only have two workers every round. Um, and But it's also, it's also deck building. Um, and I think they blend very well. The deck building is really slow, though. Um, a lot of people who maybe haven't, don't have too much exposure to deck building might instantly think of Dominion, where every single round you're buying a card but rounds are really quick like every single turn i mean hmm. you're buying a card and you might end up with a deck of like start with a deck of 10 cards and you might end with a deck of 35 40 maybe even more 
maybe even 50 cards, depending on the game. Yeah. Um, this game is not like that at all. There, it, There's much, much less deck building because there's only going to be, what, 10, 10 rounds tops. Um, so you, you're not going to buy more than probably 10 cards anyways. You might get more than that, but probably not. Um, so it's a, it's a much, much slower deck builder, but the cards are so cool and so powerful that it really makes up for it in that sense, I think, you know. Dominion has some cool and powerful cards, but most of them are, are pretty, they rely more on the combos that they'll make throughout. And as you build your deck up, you'll get more of those combos. Um, this relies less on that and more on, here's some really cool, powerful cards that interact with the board more also. Um, yeah. And I don't know if you want to, maybe maybe I should, maybe you, if you want to, you can maybe kind of explain how, what, what bridges the gap between the worker placement section and the deck building section. Yeah, you, you've played it more than me, so I'll let you cover that. Okay, okay. I just don't want to dominate the conversation since oh, that, this that, is that, kind of more fine. of my, my baby. I did um, the amazing seamless intro, so. You did, you Cody, which I feel like, <laughs> I don't know, I feel like after you mentioned it twice, we've each mentioned it now, it's it's somehow less seamless, but, you know. Ah, dang it. A, ah, <laughs> we broke it. Um, what's, what's cool is that the cards are basically all double use. You can either, whenever you place a worker on the board, you have to play a card in conjunction with that worker. And the card will tell you what areas of the board you're allowed to place a worker. But if you use the card to place a worker, you will not be able to use that card for anything else this round. And so you play a card, put a worker out. And then on your next turn, you play a card, put a worker out. Um, and then you have generally three cards left over that you'll get to play for a different ability. Um, and so that in and of itself creates a plethora of interesting situations where you have... I don't know how many different sections on the board, at least uh, seven or eight different sections. Hmm. Um, and you might really need to do something on the board, but the only card that lets you do it, you might want to use that card for whatever the card's ability is. Yeah. And so you have to make these difficult decisions, like which you know what's more important, basically. Like mm -hmm. doing that thing I want to do on the board or using this card for its ability. Um, to me, that's kind of one of the highlights is that decision-making process that that goes into placing your workers on the board or saving your cards is really, really cool. Yeah. I know you hate this game, but it makes me think a race for the galaxy in that manner. <laughs> okay, here's, here's the difference. Actually, I was thinking about this today because I, I listened to your interview with uh, Tom Lehman. Oh, and yeah. I think what I dislike is cards that can just be, that are just, that they're technically double use, but the, the second use is just kind of as fodder. You know what I mean? Mm, like actually sure. evolution has the same thing that I was just describing where cards can just be used to generate food or they can just be used to increase body size or increase population size that you don't actually yeah. use them for what they do. So they're technically multi-use, but really it's like, well, you can use the card for what it does, or there's these few general uses where you can just kind of plug it in and it does this thing no matter what card it is. Mm -hmm. Doing Imperium is different where it's like, okay, you can use this card and send a worker onto these different spots that the card specifies, or this card has this other special ability that you can use, right? And so it's not just like, well, it's either you do it for its special ability or it's just a resource, you know? It's a little bit more special than that, I think. Yeah, I suppose it's the difference between opportunity cost and just having multi-function cards, multi-function <laughs> abilities. Yes, yes. Because I feel like in games like Race for the Galaxy, it's like, well, just which cards basically do you want to trash to mm -hmm. generate resources or whatever, you know? The, in Dune, the cards have multi-uses and those multi-uses are special in and of themselves. Not just having one special use and one just general use that you can plug yeah, in the card in, you know? That's true. Multi-use cards is, a uh, seems like it's a rising niche that is quite effective. A lot of the West Kingdom games uh, use that concept, at least for uh, like yeah, they definitely pa do. Paladins, Architects, I think, kind of does that by counts, where you have these these uh, townsfolk, especially, or maybe uh, enemies that you're attacking, that they can be used in different ways depending on how, I guess, your your play style, your strategy, or even what specific action you want to take to use the top part of the card or the bottom part of the card. It's it's really a genius mechanic to be used. Yeah, and the West Kingdom games are interesting because they're generally like, you have to make the decision when you acquire the card. You can either mm -hmm. acquire it this way and get this kind of immediate thing, or you can acquire it that way and add it to your deck or do this with it. Um, 
like in a game like Dune, it's like every time the card comes up, you're making a decision about how you want to use it. In the West Kingdom games, it's like, oh, as soon as you get that card, you're making the decision definitively. Either the card is going to be this or it's going to be that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. I like it. There's there's different ways to do it. You can even, like, even the, the race for the galaxy way, where it's like, okay, it has a special use or it has a general use. That's also, I mean, it's it's... Even in Race for the Galaxy, it's it's more interesting than just having cards that you can only do one thing with, generally, right? Yeah, I agree. And it makes it shine. You know, this is just it's just kind of lobbing the ball up for you, just an easy alley. But Nate, what <laughs> okay. what do you like about Dune Imperium? What do I like about Dune Imperium? Um, I think what shines the most is what I've already mentioned is the is deciding how to use your cards. Um, I am also, uh, I'm actually a really, really big fan of the aesthetic and the art and mm. the production and really kind of everything about that with this game. Um, I love that the art is based on the movie. Um, but I really love that it's not screen captures <laughs> from the movie, <laughs> but it's, it's artist renditions. Um, and when you look at the characters, you can still see, okay, that's Jason Momoa, that's Timothy Chalamet, mm-hmm. whatever but it looks really good. It's very, very well done. Um, the that is, kind of, that is what Ark Nova should have done, homie. I'm not you know, going to get into that right now. With, with their, with their chintzy, <laughs> weird, half Listen, picture, half thing, drawing Cody. card art. What? We can both agree that Terraforming Mars is worse, right? Hmm. Okay. I'll agree that well, Race for the Galaxy is the worst. Okay. That's very <laughs> fair. That's very fair. That's very fair. Yeah. Um, but I, I, when, when this game came out, people also complained about the the game board being boring. And I actually quite like it. I think there's, and generally, it's it's kind of mostly black and brown because it's kind of a zoomed out, like, Arrakis in space. And so, yeah. like, a lot of the board is the brown of Arrakis and the rest is kind of the black of space. But then there's actually a lot of colors going on because there's so many different parts of the board that you can go. And those are um, sectioned by color, kind of. And so... There is actually a fair amount of color on the board, but in general, the, the whole board does kind of have a dismal dark appear um, and even kind of a, a matte look and texture as well. And I actually think it works really, really well for the game because that's yeah. kind of the point. Like, like it's kind of Arrakis is, is kind of this like it's just a desert planet in space. Like there's nothing mm-hmm. special about it. And I feel like that really kind of comes across. And it also makes you appreciate more like the spice tokens and the water tokens, which are bright orange and nice light blue. Yeah. They really kind of stand out from, you know, the rest, a lot of the other components in the game. And the player colors too, like I, I'm looking at the a screenshot of it here and they actually are the classic red, yellow, green, blue, but they're all kind of a, like a matte color in a sense, almost a, almost a dusty hue yeah. to sort of yeah. match the appearance of Dune and the, the aesthetic of it all. The red is kind of a like a light burgundy. The blue is a deep blue. The green, uh, I feel like there's not too much special about it necessarily. But I personally love the yellow because it's kind of a like caramel gold. I absolutely yeah. love it. Like sand, yeah. kind of. Like what? Sand? Like sand, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. So, yeah, I absolutely. I, I, I am a really big fan of how the game looks and feels for sure. Um, and of course, there is the deluxe upgrade pack where you can replace all those with minis, which... I'm sure it's cool. I'm not sure if I want to spend like the 40 bucks or whatever just for some minis, but Mm. I'm sure it would be cool. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I also, I like that there's a, there's a fair amount of moving up tracks in this game. Uh, And basically there's four different houses that you can gain influence with if you uh, send your worker to one of their spots. And so whenever you, that's even cooler. It's like you play a card, you send a worker to one of the spots of these houses. They each have two spots for each house. And if you go to one of those, the spot you pick has an action, but just for going on a spot from that house, you also move up on their track, their influence Mm -hmm. track, which all of those four tracks are kind of a little race in a way. Like if you move up twice, you get a point, but if you move up four times, you get a temporary point, which you'll keep as long as nobody passes you up on that track, which is really Mm -hmm. cool, I think. Um, And so so I love that also. And I think... It's weird. I, I I don't want to compare this to Catan, but I mean, base Catan and this are both a race to ten points, and both of these kind of have this feeling like you're really 
excited when you get a point. Like it means a lot <laughs> when you get a point. When you move yeah. up twice on a track and you get a point, it's like, whew, okay, I earned that. That's good. One point. I'm literally 10% of the way there already, you know? Um, I think that's kind of a fun feeling too, as opposed to like a, a Castles of Burgundy game where you routinely are getting five or 10 points on a turn, sometimes yeah. even more, sometimes 40, 50 points on a turn, you know? Um, it's a very, very different feel. You value the points more and it's a yeah, little more special more- when you earn them. Yeah, there's more of a focus that comes with it, which I really like. That yeah. often you don't see that in games where you have Well, I mean, this game also has a whole bunch of options. You you can approach the game in different ways, so many different uh like you said, seven plus, probably more than that, like worker areas, not just spaces. And depending on the the player card that you have can determine something of your play style or those intrigue cards can be different ways they're going to be affecting the game. But even yeah. so, like you said, it's not like you're going to get 5, 10, 15 points on a turn. You, you've got to be focusing on how how specifically are you going to get your individual points to get you up to 10 or more. Yeah, and, and some of them you can get just by doing things, but some of them have to be got by defeating your opponents, whether it's on those yeah. tracks passing them up or whether it's in the, the combat that's happening on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not going it, to... I'm not, I'm not going to say you're not going to, but it's difficult to to win the game to get to 10 points without taking some of those points from other people whether yeah. it's in combat or passing up on tracks it's it's it'd be very difficult to do i think um but i'm, I'm glad you mentioned the entry cards because i kind of forgot about those which is funny because actually like i'm not a professional at this game uh mm-hmm. by any means uh, but i have played it quite a bit and i will say that the entry cards feel kind of like the key to the game for me mm-hmm. i feel like the more entry cards you can get your hands on in this game the better chance you have because they have so many powers. Some of them are really like really lame. Like you get it and you're like, wow, three spice. Okay. I can play this card and get three spice. That kind of (laughs) sucks, you know, but then you have some, I mean, sure. Three spice can, can be a a huge deal sometimes, but there are other ones that are like, as soon as you like get the card and you read it and you're like, this could be game changing. If I play this in the right, the right situation, you know, especially the ones that mess with combat a little bit, like, yeah, the entry cards are, are really amazing. Or you can even get points after the game ends. That's what I love. This game is technically a race to 10, but then there are people might have cards that score after the game ends, and you could actually yeah. pass somebody up after they reach 10. I love the, the resources in the game, too. They're very limited, and so it makes you fight for them. And when you get resources, you it feels good. You feel powerful, you know? Yeah. Like money money is pretty limited in the game. And so you really have to decide, oh man, okay, am I going to spend this money and uh, try to get my my new worker? Or am I going to spend it over here? And like, uh, I don't remember what else money is used for, but I remember it being sort of a, a mind bender at times with how you're going to deploy it on a given turn. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think I I don't like stressful games. And so as a general rule, when a game has limited resources, that kind of makes me worry a little bit. Hmm. But in this game, like it doesn't feel super stressful, but it definitely is stressful at times. And just that, not like you're pulling your hair out, but you're like, you really have to think. You really have to think a few steps ahead. Like, okay, I can't just blindly throw resources here and there and just randomly make decisions. Like you really need to ponder, okay, I have gained these resources, like you just said. Okay, I've gotten these resources. What is the wisest way to use them? Because the yeah. resources are so limited, which also, again, is very thematic as well. Well, yeah, I mean, it matches the whole play style of the game too. Your workers are extremely limited. I mean, only having two workers with, to a maximum of three, the the cards you have are limited. You really have to decide which cards you want to use to play workers and which cards you want to reserve to to fight with or to, to purchase other cards. It really is... Uh, like very strongly an efficiency game, I think. Yeah, uh, it, I, I have an almost an efficiency puzzle, you might say. You um, you could indeed say that. I would say that actually. Would could okay. and should. Nate has should. just said that. Dune Imperium is an efficiency puzzle, <laughs> um, but also you have to. I, I feel like you have to be able to to pivot and to change directions in this game if you have to also. Like like you were saying, there are asymmetrical player powers. Um, they impact the game a little bit. I don't think they impact it a ton, 
Um, it's not like they make you have tunnel vision. Like you have to like, if you don't focus on the strategy that it's nudging you towards, then you're, you don't stand a chance. It's not like mm -hmm. that. Um, but I, I think that they're, they're general enough that you can really kind of pursue whatever vic path to victory you want and also can easily pivot and change paths to victory chain, try something different. If you have to just based on the cards that come up, uh, in the, in the market or, based on the things that other people do or on a combat, not going the way you expect it or, you know, whatever the, yeah. based on the intrigue cards you draw, like you have to be able to change directions and just weasel your way up to those 10 points before somebody else does, you know? Yeah. One thing I forgot about is the ownership concept of worker places or work, worker spots. Mm, it's not yeah. on all the spaces. There's only like, uh, I don't know, three or four places, yeah, but you three. can assign a banner. And then anytime anybody goes on that spot, you exclusively get a special bonus. That's not something you see very commonly in worker placement games. It's not. And I actually, I really want to see it more because even in this game, it's not a very common occurrence. Like you might mm -hmm. see a couple banners go out in a game throughout the course of the whole game. You might see a couple banners go out. And so those people might generate a couple of resources off of it, but that's it. I feel it's a really, really small part and I kind of wish it was a bigger part, honestly. And I would like to see that in other games more as a more involved part of the of the design, for sure. Because it is a cool yeah. concept that you can kind of, somebody has to kind of pay a tax to you almost, you yeah. know, to, to go there. An underutilized concept that we would like to see more. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, is there anything you do not like about this game? Anything that bothers you? Hmm. I mean, originally it was just the point concept. I, I didn't like the race idea of I just have to fight and scrap for these points and I could lose by the difference of a, of a single point or I could just do really bad and lose by a bunch of points, which has happened yeah. before for me. Um, but, but that's just kind of progressively changed. I don't know if it's just appreciating the thematics of the game more or just appreciating the game itself, or I'm just maturing in my board game experiences and I don't mind um, win conditions as much. So I know that's not really <laughs> a thing I dislike about the game anymore. Um, I think it would be nice if the player powers were a little bit more unique um, and strong. Granted, that can be difficult to balance, especially when the whole game is basically an efficiency puzzle. Because you, at that point, really have to make sure that your different player abilities are um, are equal and aren't going to get too out of balance in proportion to each other. Yeah, definitely. Um, it requires a lot of playtesting to, to yeah, ensure that. for sure. But I think that's maybe a spot um, that maybe a future expansion or something could, could add. Obviously, well, I haven't played the newest expansion. Maybe it adds some more interesting player powers. I mean, Rise of X, the first expansion, definitely does. Um, I mean, you're right. And like I was also saying that the player powers are kind of general. They don't, they don't focus you down one kind of one path. And I wonder, because in Rise of X, the player powers are more specialized and a little more interesting and also more mm. complicated, some of them. Um, and they don't, they manage to be more specialized without giving you a narrow focus still, oh, um, okay. which is cool, which is really cool. I need to play that more than, I know I played it with you once, but I don't remember yeah, where I used The weird thing is when I, when I had the Rise of X expansion, and I won't talk about the expansion too much here, but I think the first time I played it, I was really underwhelmed by it. Like really, really underwhelmed. Um, hmm. But still, every time I played after that, I played with the expansion because, you know, why went I? It didn't make the game worse. I just didn't feel like it really enhanced the experience all that much. And the more I played it, the more it grew on me. And now, like, the, the base game is still solid. It's still a very, very good game. But with the expansion in, now that I've played it quite a few times, uh, you really, it just takes quite a few plays to really understand how it impacts the game and how to utilize what it brings to the game. Um, I think both the game and the the first expansion have pretty steep learning curves, or at least comprehension curves. Like, it doesn't take that long actually to learn Dune. It's very simple. You play a card, and whatever the card says, those are the places you're allowed to place a worker on the board. That's yeah. pretty much it. But actually comprehending the game and understanding how to do well is much more difficult. 
And I think the, the Rise of X expansion was the same way. And so it took a few plays to really appreciate it. Yeah, any game that does that definitely goes up a notch automatically in my book because Brass is very much like that. I mean, gra- granted, it's still hard to learn how to play, um, yeah. but you can get to where like, okay, well, I can put this tile on the board and I can take a loan and get money. Yay. But it, it can take some some careful study to learn to how to play it well. Yeah, I, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that I will never again beat you in, in Brass Birmingham. I think I won the very first time I played and I've only played it twice now. And I know oh. that you've played it much more than I, and I'm pretty sure I'll, I will probably never stand a chance of beating you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. I haven't played it in a while. Maybe I can make this commitment to not play it until I see you again, and then we'll have a well, that's, an even That's match. kind of a sad commitment, especially since it's <laughs> one of your wife's favorite games. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're definitely going to play it before we see you again. Yeah. Uh, well, th- this is becoming a long podcast, Nate. We we need to talk about the pros and cons of IP games. We do, which is which is a uh, very convenient as we just finished glorifying uh, yeah. an IP game. Well, um, IP, yeah, IP games are terrible, man. They, they were never <laughs> they're good. <laughs> they're I, garbage. Yeah, they're all garbage. Okay, well, yeah. real quickly, why don't you maybe just define IP? Because IP is not actually, it's not a board game term. Intellectual property nah. is not a board game term at all. So why yeah. don't you go ahead and define that? I, I'm going to give you the Cody definition. I don't know how accurate go for this it. is. But I'm, I'm just telling you how I approached considering this topic. I, I think of an IP game as intellectual property, this theme has appeared somewhere in media before, specifically maybe a video game, but most popularly it's going to be a a movie or a TV show. So it's something where the concept, the intellectual property already exists, but then that theme has been uh, taken and employed in a board game form, which has its pros and cons, which is why we're here today to talk about it. Yes. Um, I think I, I will give you the Nate analysis of the Cody definition. I think technically <laughs> right. to be an intellectual property, it has to actually be licensed as well. It can't uh-huh. just be something that, that somebody created and didn't license. Um, and so IP could be Star Wars, but I think it could also technically be Cheez-Its. I think like both of those things are, are technically intellectual properties. I could <laughs> I be wrong. Think of that. I could be wrong, actually. I could be 100% wrong. But. Dude, do you remember that Cheez-It game I looked up and found on... Board game game? Oh, yes. Wow, yeah, that's man. so weird. I said Jesus. That's great. Have anyway, you bought that game yet? Not yet. I don't know if it's available anywhere. I need to add it to okay. my list, though. eBay, man. eBay. <laughs> so, so, like I said, we did just, just finish you know, glorifying an IP game. And then we jokingly started saying that all IP games are terrible. <laughs> but the reason we so quickly changed to that is not just because we had just been glorifying an IP game, but because in our, I think in both of our minds, in general, IP, uh, intellectual property being associated with a game is a very scary thing. Yes. Because personally, I, you, you just have to worry about cash grabs, basically. Especially yep. with things like Star Wars, Harry Potter, Marvel. Do these these franchises that are insanely popular i just worry worry so much about games and i think we've both been burned also from yeah. ip games that it's like the thing like the, we love the whatever the ip is the the it look the game looks good maybe you know um and then you play it and it's like there's just there's nothing good there at all yeah. it's just just terrible um yeah. and the more times you're burned on that the more wary you are of all these Star Wars games and Marvel games and all this, you know? Yeah. The problem is you're, you're catering to an established fan base that's already there. So it's going to be maybe not easy, but much simpler to market the game. But if that's all you're relying on and you you don't have good game design, oftentimes you're going to see some, some pretty garbage games. Well, that's the, that's the interesting thing is that most games will they were they have to rely on something to get people to buy the game right and so either it's going to be how the game looks or it's going to be the actual mechanisms of the game like Mm -hmm. for the people to actually look into it and say okay does this actually look like a solid game here the interesting thing about ips is that they're basically operating solely on the intellectual property itself being the the operative aspect of the game that either attracts people or doesn't attract people 
right? Mm -hmm. Because if there's a, I don't know, I'm not, I'll just say I'm not a huge fan of Marvel. And so if a game comes out that has Marvel attached to it, I'm instantly less interested in that game. I know nothing (laughs) about the game yet. I'm instantly less interested in buying that game because it has Marvel attached to it. Whereas for other people, it's the exact opposite. As soon as they see Marvel, their ears perk up and they're like, oh, Marvel, okay, I'll check that out, you know? And so it's a very different part of the game that either attracts or scares people away. Yeah, I I have kind of a weird story here for you now. It's related to that, Um, specifically Marvel. So there's the game Thanos Rising, which I played quite a few times. And I honestly don't mind the game, but I would probably classify it closer to a gimmick Um, than a good game so uh, basically a a gimmick ip game and really that's just because there's a lot of dice rolling going on and if you roll poorly you can it's a cooperative game and it can be pretty simple to lose without it being your fault at all uh just by the way that the dice land and then yeah thanos turns and starts punching everybody then everybody dies and yay it's satisfying when you do do well and you get some good combos and you can start building up your characters. But overall, it's like, eh. Here's where IP stepped in a second time, though, Nate. They they rethemed it and just came out last year um, an Avatar The Last Airbender themed version of it called Fire Nation Rising. Is that the... Wait, I'm... is that like the 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 avatar rpg that was coming out or whatever or is that totally something different uh no no that's something else it's basically they just took thanos rising the the same base concept but reskinned it with um avatar so you're fighting i think it's fire lord fire lord ozai at different regions in the the avatar map but then you can be playing as uh like the the ang gang the avatar gang zuko ang katara Sokka, and then there's different characters that you can acquire and so i'm sure it's probably going to be the same kind of luck based game where there's a certain amount of strategy and skill but you you can probably just get burned by the game but i'm much more excited about it because it's avatar are you really Marvel. wow i am i am yeah interesting interesting so i mean it's basically a new look same great taste thing right yeah but <laughs> yeah same mediocre I mean, taste so here's the question if if the games were identical in every way, functionally identical, hmm. would you buy the Avatar one? Because you right now it sounds like you wouldn't buy Thanos Rising. Nah, no, nah, I wouldn't. I'd lean towards I would. Um, I'm hoping though, and perhaps I'm even confident that it's going to be there's going to be some different mechanics, maybe even some refined portions of Thanos Rising that function better. Mm-hmm. It's not a guarantee, but that that's my hope. Well, I've had a... S- oh, my goodness. <gasps> what? You know what I just realized? What did you realize? Okay. So I was going to ask you a question later on. I was going to ask you what is the best <laughs> IP game and what is the worst IP game you've ever played. Uh, and I'll go okay. ahead and tell you the worst IP game I've ever played, and I did not make this connection until this very second, is called Harry Potter Death Eaters Rising. <laughs> is it like is it the same thing because i was just gonna say there's a that reminds me of a game that i hate that is basically just rolling dice and you're at the mercy of the game more or less oh it is and- the same I'm, I'm looking at it now the board is exactly the same <sighs> oh that, okay, is- that makes me nervous for avatar now <laughs> but this is this is actually really really funny because i had already written this down as like this is the worst like off the top of my head, it's the worst intellectual property game I've ever played because it really is just like you have some cards, you roll dice, you get to make a couple decisions, but if you roll bad, you lose basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my goodness. That's kind of, that's really, really funny because it's the same game reskinned multiple times and I feel like it really sums up what I was just saying a second ago that huh. like if you, it's like a, it's like a, what is it? Like a, um, a pig with lipstick on, right? Yeah, it's like you put the lipstick on and it looks nice, and then you find out it's still a pig behind the lipstick, you know. Yeah. And they're just putting different shades of lipstick on it and and shoving it to a different demographic. I'm kind of it's nervous almost, for Fire Nation Rising now. <laughs> it's almost criminal, honestly. Yeah, <laughs> it's very it's very predatory. <laughs> I, I'm looking closer at Fire Nation Rising, and it it is 100 percent the exact same format. Who who knows if the rule scheme is different, but hmm. 
And so it See, almost like IP games I, suck, Nate. <laughs> they do all of them. They all suck. But no, actually, it, it makes you it makes you appreciate the IP games that are done well more, right? Hmm. Like I I know that there are Marvel games out there that are well made games, but I'm just not at all interested to try and because. Also, if you think about it, there's so many people that aren't in the board game community at all that might get pulled into it, like from a Marvel themed mm-hmm. game. And so a Marvel themed yeah. game that's going to appeal to people that aren't in the board game community also has to be a rather simple game if it wants to appeal to all these people that aren't familiar with board games, right? If you're trying to pull somebody into the, to get to buy your game that has never played board games before, you can't make it a super complex, you know, interesting game right (laughs) and so yeah yeah well while i was preparing yesterday for this podcast i was doing something of a case study um, of my own ip games that i've played i was just curious like how many how many total have i played uh, that i can remember based off my list and how many of them do i consider gimmicks and i was actually kind of surprised at the ratio so I counted up, I've played about 24 IP-based games, and I only consider eight of them to be gimmicks, which means the solid majority actually were pretty good games. So when you say eight of them were gimmicks, you mean the other games you thought the theme, like the IP itself was not gimmicky, but was well integrated with a solid game? Uh, yeah, but if, if I'm calling an IP game a gimmick, I mean it's relying... Eighty-nine percent on the fact that it's based off of this IP, and it has not good game mechanics. Right. Like the, okay. the designers were not really on on point. So, is that do you think indicative of the general ratio of good to bad IP games, or do you think that's just indicative of your good judgment and the IP uh, games you've played? I'm guessing it's probably more indicative of my good judgment because here's the thing: like if if a game is popular, it's probably popular for a reason, and it's more likely that I'm going to hear about it and that I'm going to buy it. True. I am assuming, like the Cheez It Scrabble game, for example, there's probably <laughs> so many IP games out there that are actually just garbage. But here's the thing there's a bunch of garbage normal games, too. That's true. That's so, very true. Well, I'm, I'm very curious what the ratio is between the two. Well, it's very subjective, but. Sure. Um, I will say that I looked up on Board Game Geek. I, I just typed in Marvel and searched. And there uh, were, I couldn't tell you how many games there were above 20,000, like the ranking 20,000. Like <laughs> there were a lot. And say what you will about the board game ranking system, but to not make it into the top 20,000 is, is kind of sad. And yeah. there were a, a decent sized handful of Marvel games that did not make the cut. So, yeah. and that's just Marvel. I'm sure you could do the same thing with Harry Potter, with Star Wars, you know, and I... I hate Harry Potter Death Eaters Rising, and I guarantee that's in the top 20,000. And so think about the games that aren't making the cut, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he- let, let me just run you by the, the, the eight games that I've considered oh, yes, to, be, to be gimmicks. Yeah. I know one of them, the other ones for sure. Oh, okay. I Firefly sure Shiny do. Dice might make it. One <laughs> <laughs> well, of these, I think maybe you've forgotten about that I, I'm curious to, to hear your opinion on. Okay. I've got. Okay. Fantastic Beast Perilous Pursuit. It w- wasn't a terrible game, but it's just themed on Fantastic Beast. And again, you're just doing a bunch of dice rolling and it can be pretty luck based. Okay. Indeed, Firefly Shiny Dice is on there. Yeah. Although we, we have discussed how that's not we as have. much the fault of the designer, yes. since yes. the designer wanted you to be able to complete missions. And then for whatever <laughs> catastrophic, ridiculous, stupid reason, the publisher was like, no, you're going to roll your dice and then see if you happen to complete the mission. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's great. Just, yeah, we, we've talked about that before. It's garbage. Um, I included Firefly Flux in this because I don't think Flux is a terrible game, but at that point, they just took Flux and then just rethemed it. So, really, the only thing that's being sold is Firefly. Exactly. Yeah. You don't know what I'm saying? Uh, here's one, maybe jogging memory Master and Commander. Oh, my goodness. Do you dude, remember that that's one? A throwback. Yeah, I man. Don't, I don't actually remember the game at all. Honestly, I remember you have some ships. Uh, I don't remember anything else. Yeah, I don't remember if that's the exact title of it either, but it was, it was themed off of the the Russell Crowe movie, which is based off of a book series where you're, you're sailing your oh. ships around and then you're trying to shoot each other and you're rolling the dice for the wind. And 
It looks Wait, so cool, do but you, an IP game. Do you remember that game well enough to to confidently say that it, it deserves a spot on this these eight gimmicky games? Yeah, yeah, I, I remember it fairly well. It basically just had okay. cool um, ship pieces. Yeah, it did. Um, but for how it represented sailing warfare was kind of pathetic. So <laughs> it was a it was it was an IP <laughs> game. Huh. Yeah. Um, then I have World of Warcraft. Uh, Wrath of the Lich King, which, as we oh, talked yeah. about, is just pandemic reskinned with World of Warcraft thematics. I mean, there, there's a couple different but you actually mechanics s- to play. You said you actually liked it more than pandemic, which I mean, for what it's worth. Sure, but- I, 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 yeah, I would play it more than pandemic, but it's it's barely contributing anything beyond the World of Warcraft theme. Like, sure, it, it adds a couple okay. of thing things, but at that point, I'm still considering it a gimmick. Like, what what's being sold is world of warcraft yeah next i have trivial pursuit the lord of the rings <laughs> Oof. yeah because that i mean Although, it's just trivia yeah but that's the thing is that that's a little bit different isn't it because actually the theme really does change the entire game if it's a trivia based game right and so that's, that's true for people who like lord of the rings it's like well yeah actually you know what you're getting it's not a bait and switch right you know what you're getting, and actually, it is what you want. You want a Lord of the Rings themed Trivial Pursuit, sure. right? So I feel like that. I feel like I don't necessarily agree on that one because hmm. the game Trivial Pursuit is proven and tested, and people like it. And they're taking Lord of the Rings and saying, "Hey, here's for our Lord of the Rings fans who like it. Come do this trivia." Instead of taking a bad game that doesn't have good mechanisms or anything and just slapping different themes on it to pull in different people to get sucked into this game. Hmm. That's what I would say. I'll, I'll, I'll allow it, and I'll knock this down to half of a game. So I have seven and a half <laughs> games. <that we're> getting. <laughs> okay, fair. Um, and then next, I've, I've just got Thanos Rising on there, which we already oh, talked about. Of course. And here's, yeah. here's, here's a, my bit of a spicy opinion. Marvel United. Okay. And it, it's, it's a bit spicy because I know a lot of people like it. Um, it, was, it was in the People's Choice Top 100 so far for the... Um, top 100 from 2022 i've just played it once and i i guess it's it's got some stuff it's got some stuff to it um where you you got some some decks of cards that you're playing and you're moving your people around but it still just kind of feels like thanos rising to me and to me the gimmick is just that you've got these little cartoon plastic miniatures that seem to be selling the game more than the function of the game yeah, I I was interested kind of in Marvel United just because it was so popular. Um, and But the thing is, I like I said earlier, I'm not that interested in the Marvel theme. I'm not at all interested in the, the cutesy kind of chibi whatever theme. And so, and also I think the game's pretty light. I mean, it's not like a totally luck-based game. No, I wouldn't say, totally luck-based is not a, the appropriate wording, but a very luck based game such as the rising games we've been mentioning. Um, but it is still a pretty light cooperative game, right? Yeah. From, from what I remember, I'm sure, I mean, there's kind of all these expansions where you can play as different characters and add different enemies. So maybe that gets more complicated, but yeah, that's about all it is. So what is your, what is your favorite game with an intellectual property attached to it? Ooh, is it also, my- is it doom? Because for me, it is definitely doom. No question. Uh, yep, it is also Dune. That's easy because right. I can just look at my top hundred games and find the yeah, first exactly. IP game, which is Dune Imperium. So. Yeah, yeah. Dude, we should start calling it Dune Iperium. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we shouldn't. Okay, okay so for for those of you who have been on the fence with Dune Imperium, actually, I feel like I like I'm I'm part of a few board game groups, whatever, on on Facebook, and I feel like a question that's come up a few times are people asking the community, should I buy Dune Imperium or should I buy Lost Ruins Varnak? And I don't want to get into that discussion right now <laughs> about those two games, yeah. but I would definitely say if you're on the fence about Dune Imperium, it, I would, I would go for it because yeah. it is a, oh, it's sure. a phenomenal game. If you give it the, if you give it the time, if you give it the place to bloom, it's a very beautiful sandy flower. And remember, I thought that IP games would usually be a gimmick. And sometimes they are, but not always.
Hey, if you guys would like to reach out to us, we would love you to do that at tabletopshop23 at gmail.com. That's good. Also, like and subscribe and all that fun stuff. We love you guys. Hopefully you love us. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>